the main reason why I don't think it's possible to squeeze one of these markets, uh, like what the Hunt brothers did in 1980, you got position limits in these markets. But what I don't understand is why Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs, who's one of the authorized participants, would go on to CNBC on February 4th and say a short squeeze was impossible right after they inserted language talking exactly about those exact conditions. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics on Wednesday, February 17th. In the middle of a bit of a storm here in Austin, Texas, power has been knocked out in many sections of the town. Although I did find the Aloft Hotel, who's still got some power and an internet connection. So here we are and getting ready to bring you up to speed on some rather shocking things going on in the silver world as the very tight, fragile conditions have spread to London, as we'll dig into. Real quick, tonight's video is sponsored by Winston Gold, as you can see here. Uh, Winston bringing you this episode, and we'll have a little review of them later on in the show. So thanks again to Winston, and do take a look and stick around to hear a couple minutes more about them. But to dig in, I have this one up. This was from Friday, a couple uh, articles that I've been wanting to get to and now finally will, because for the last two weeks in the face of historic events in the silver market, we've seen articles like this, JP Morgan saying to sell, TD Ameritrade counting Twitter hashtags, and here saying silver short squeeze don't believe the hype. Um, with all due respect to the income generator, I will demonstrate today why the, this is <laughs> far from just hype. Here he's talking about the Reddit rebellion, uh, internet communities, merging dynamics. So let's see what he says about the ETF flows. Here's GameStop and the differences. And it's traded to as high its levels. Chatter suggesting valuations can reach random numbers like 100 or 1,000. One quick comment on that. Now, certainly there's a degree to which, you know, just because I say a stock is worth $200 doesn't necessarily mean that it goes there is worth anything near there. Although countering that, and I'm leave you to extrapolate some balance of the two, we do live in a world where there's incredible amounts of money printed that's flowing in the system that's juicing things around. And if there's ever been a barometer of psychology, well, it is the financial market. So I do think there is inherently a value that something is worth. Now, if enough people believe differently, can it go to a different level? Well, we've seen the banks push silver to $25. Could someone push it to a number in between 100 or 1,000? Especially given some of the things that I will be going through in this video today, I think that's possible, but uh, talks about movements, establishing. But here you, you see you go through all this article um, any of the other articles, and we will cover that because I think he missed the bigger meaning, the author of this article, in what Jeff Curry said here, which <laughs> you'll be hearing plenty more about that in the coming days and weeks. Here's Jeff Curry saying that the ETF is 900 million, which is a small flow compared to a 25 billion ounce market. I would dispute those assertions or those numbers, and we'll explain why. Maybe to start with, here you see Ronan Manley, another incredible article. This one came out Sunday night. Silver squeeze hits London as SLV warns of limited available silver supply. No matter what you're doing, if you haven't read this already, find a way to read it. Um, it's incredible what Ronan and others have uncovered. True team effort on the behalf of the silver community. And I, again, love the way that we see a crime happening and now people are not resorting to crime tactics to end this, but just sharing truthful information. And what's stunning is that many of you have heard me talk about, or you saw for yourself, how two weeks ago there was so much silver buying that the retailers went offline over the weekend. Then silver opens, goes up, uh, hits above 30 in the futures on February 1st. First Majestic in the 24 to $25 range. Again, what no one on Wall Street has been talking about. When there's a short position as big as it was on First Majestic, we've talked about it before. You can go back on the channel and see two videos we did shortly before it occurred. 
when you go from $13 to $24.25, those are the types of moves where shops get blown out. I remember that from my trading days. And it would certainly seem plausible to me that some people were in trouble with that $24 price. I'll label that as just my opinion. I don't know, but certainly when I am looking at the different scenarios and possibilities, then the next day in the face of what was basically a doubling the previous record of SLV demand, you see the price come down 10% the same day that JP Morgan puts their sell report out. But here's what I don't get. How come a day after that, they went in and changed the prospectus of SLV in the middle of the night? They didn't tell me one. I didn't know. I can't find it on their website. I can't find a press release. I have to go to Ronan Manley's site to find it. And additionally, maybe some of you heard how I called iShares on February 5th. I talked to them for 40 minutes trying to get an audit. They didn't mention any prospectus changes. And here, look at what they put in there. The demand for silver may temporarily exceed available supply. Why did you put that in there February 3rd, the day after JP Morgan put out a report saying to sell silver? Not say anything. To the extent that demand exceeds supply, authorized participants may not be able to readily acquire sufficient amounts of silver necessary for the basket. Hmm. Well, let's see what Jeff Curry said about this when he went on to CNBC because Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs was an authorized participant. And let's see what he said about the sturdiness of the trust and whether there's anything to be concerned about the day after they made these changes and didn't tell anyone that I've ever met. Yeah, Jeff, I just want to push back against something you said, not because I think you're wrong, but I want you to clarify it. You point out that it would be impossible for retail investors to force a, a squeeze in something like silver and the differences between cornering a commodity versus squeezing a stock. Um, but I remember 10 years ago, there was a moment when GLD, the gold ETF, had more assets in it in dollar terms than the SPY. And I do think that GLD was moving the price of gold. I, I can imagine a similar situation um, with, with silver and the silver ETF if people get excited enough about it where what happens in the markets ends up influencing what happens with the actual metal in real life. You're saying you don't think that that's a possibility? I mean, you're talking 900 million ounces in the ETF versus a 25 billion ounce market. And by the way, the-, the But the those billion ounces market, don't move. The, but the, the silver market- They just is, sit. And then you, Those other ounces just sit, they don't move. Right, but the vast, I mean, you look at the flows going in and out of these ETFs, they're not that big. But, but I guess my question is, forget the ETF, um, in terms of thinking about how are you gonna create a squeeze? The shorts are the ETFs. The ETFs buy the physical, they turn around and they sell on the COMEX to be able to hedge that physical position like any other corporate. It's right. not a naked short like in an equity. But here's the main reason why I don't think it's possible to squeeze one of these markets uh, like what the Hunt brothers did in 1980, you got position limits in these markets and they've gotten tighter and tighter. There's seven and a half million ounces right now. Now, what he doesn't mention there is a lot because certainly the fact that the banks go over the position limits regularly. Um, but he specifically talked about why you can enforce a short squeeze. And it's interesting. You see the date here on CNBC's website. You see February 4th. But what I don't understand is why Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs, who's one of the authorized participants, would go on to CNBC on February 4th and say a short squeeze was impossible right after they inserted language talking exactly about those exact conditions. Hard to imagine that he personally didn't know about that. And in either case, whether he did or not, given Goldman's position in the financial markets, the way they influence markets, Gee, that seems like either that was negligence or he flat out lied, one of the two. But even going further, just in case it wasn't clear enough that he left out material information. Again, he was talking about why there couldn't be a squeeze. But look at this paragraph that's inserted. A significant change in the sentiment of investors towards silver may occur. 
Investors may purchase shares to speculate on the price of silver or to hedge existing silver exposure. Speculation on the price of silver may involve long and short positions. To the extent that the aggregate short exposure exceeds the number of shares available for purchase? Are they saying that you can short more shares than are available to be purchased? Isn't that the definition? He just confirmed that in his words that, or no, not his words, this prospectus just made it sound like you can have a naked short just in this thing alone. You don't even need the COMEX. To the extent aggregate short exposure exceeds the number of shares available, investors with short exposure may have to pay a premium to repurchase shares for delivery. Investors with short exposure may have to pay a premium to purchase. That's the definition of a short squeeze that he just said was impossible. In turn, those repurchases may dramatically increase the price of the shares until additional shares are issued through the creation process, which they just told you they couldn't do up here. Authorized participants may not be able to readily acquire sufficient amounts for creation of a basket. And then here they're saying that in the case of a short squeeze, they're not going to create a basket. Again, here we go. Those repurchases may dramatically increase the price of shares until additional shares are issued through the creation process. This could lead to volatile price movements that are not directly correlated to the price of silver. One thing honest, at least they're admitting that all these derivative junk products they make aren't correlated to the price of silver. But as I'm reading this, and again, this is just my thought, I'm not saying this is how it is, but at least the way I interpret it, and I will research further, those repurchases may dramatically increase the price of the shares until shares are issued through the creation process. You just saw, they said they may not be able to get the silver ready for creation. So I'm not saying this is what they're doing, but at least upon reading it and thinking about it for a couple of days, that opens the possibility that there could be a short squeeze going on and whether they have the silver or not, they could say we can't get it, which would basically anyone who's trying to, who has to buy that back and is getting short squeeze. That's at least one interpretation that as a former equity options trader who ran a specialist post on the New York Stock Exchange, I've seen people exploit and that's what at least some people who read through this carefully would be wise to pay attention to. Um, we'll have more on some of the comments he made there because I don't know how else you can say either that was gross negligence for the authorized participant, the head of their commodities division. And again, just to be clear again, his words, not mine. Excited enough about it where what happened, you don't think that that's a possibility? I mean, you're talking 900 million ounces in the ETF versus a 25 billion. And by the way, both of those numbers, as I will detail in a very soon to be released future video, I would dispute and give an incredibly misleading perception of the market, in my opinion, but we'll continue on. Market. By the way, the, the, but the those silver billion market, ounces don't move. The, but the, the silver market, they just is, sit. And then you, go on. They just but sit. Those other ounces just sit. They don't move. Right, but the vast, I mean, you look at the flows going in and out of these ETFs, they're not that big. But, but I guess my question is... Not that big? What happened was record setting. In fact, let's just dispute, dispro not dispute, disprove that. These three spikes, that's Friday the 29th, February 1st, 1st and then February 2nd. So one day amounts. Here is the six month chart. You can see these three, it's the same ones bigger than all the other ones. Here's going out one year, bigger. Two years, it's not even close. Five years, see that 61, look how it dwarfs anything. Here's 10 years, here's 20 years. That 61, that went into the trust that Jeff Curry's Goldman Sachs is one of the authorized participants to that changed the language the day before he had the audacity to go on to CNBC and say this. And he says, yes, they're not that big, but, but going in and out of these ETFs, they're not right. But the vast, I mean, you look at the flows going in and out of these ETFs, they're not that big, but let's that isn't true. And here's the proof. Here, we'll go, does this thing go back 20? This is as far as the chart goes back. There's 61. 
here's 35. That was a record. That here, here was the previous. Looks like he got about 20 a couple times, which had happened about a week before. So for him to say that those aren't that big, <laughs> maybe people shouldn't be listening to Jeff Curry for financial advice. But let's see that we'll get back to his short squeeze comment. But I guess my question is forget the ETF. Um, in terms of thinking about how you. And I might add, before even comments of why the short squeeze is impossible, let, let him hear in his words this crazy hedging situation where somehow there's a, a need to, to hedge and sell COMEX futures. Going to create a squeeze. The shorts are the ETFs. The ETFs buy the physical, they turn around and they sell on the COMEX to be able to hedge that physical position like any. And here's the thing. Let's say that iShares is collecting money for people who want to buy SLV thinking they're getting silver. If there's any sort of hedge, if they collect the money, but they haven't sourced the physical silver and they're doing it during that day, wouldn't they hedge with a long position? Think about it like this. You take your $25, you send it to iShares. They're holding $25. And they let's now they confirmed on the phone that the silver will be deposited by the end of that day. So let's say you have the $25 and you want to lock it in. You would you would you would get long a future with well, this. What he says, it's <laughs> we'll continue on other corporate. It's wow. not a naked short like in an equity. But here's the main in fact. His the contract and what he the, the change in the contract wording plus what he just said here created two new naked shorts. The reason why I don't think it's possible to squeeze one of these markets uh, like what the Hunt brothers did in 1980, you got position limits in these markets. Which again, some of the banks and I believe I'm I'm going to call the CME today so I make sure I'm completely accurate. Take a guess which are a few of the banks that, at least when I look at the recent limit changes and then how much delivery they've taken or issued are over the limits, but we'll come back. And they've gotten tighter and tighter. There's seven and a half million ounces right now, um, which means that if you were to squeeze it, you would have to divvy up the position. To and that seven and a half would be the inventory off the exchange 53 times, which each position worth $217 million and then do it in a coordinated fashion. I will put money on a bet challenging those numbers. And I don't understand why, as an authorized participant, and I don't understand why, as an authorized participant of Goldman Sachs and someone who goes with Goldman Sachs name onto CNBC, said what that man just said on February 4th, and this is what they put into the language, which I can't find a press release on the site. I called February 5th. They didn't tell me. So if they told investors somewhere, I'm not smart enough to figure that out. Of course, here is the article Ronan had last week, which showed that in this same incredible arrangement that I wouldn't put my money in anywhere near, you see that JP Morgan. Oh, by the way, here's another kicker. JP Morgan, who settled and has never said anything but paid or at least the department of justice and cftc said they settled for 920 million hopefully they paid it for manipulating gold and silver on hundreds of thousands of occasions who's the custodian of this trust only person to look verify anything that's in there in over a year almost almost a year rather how long are they the custodian jp morgan's also an authorized participant i mean <clears throat> i <th> <laughs> I think they're, I won't say who I think they might target to be their lawyer one day. I'm going to try and keep myself out of trouble, but is there JP Morgan custodian and authorized participant of this trust where no one I know understands how they could get the metal in. Then here's JP Morgan custodian of SSLV custodian of PMAG, PM, PM, custodian of SIVR. A lot of trust in JP Morgan, more than I'd be willing to extend with my money. And then sure enough, would you believe it that
And sure enough, would you believe it that the Aberdeen SIVR Trust, which also uses JP Morgan London as metal custodian, quietly amended its prospectus to both sinister and comical effect and in selfie fashion, uploaded a new version of its prospectus, inserting the following wording. Let's see what they said. As of the date of this prospectus, an online campaign intended to harm hedge funds and large banks is encouraging retail investors to purchase silver and shares of silver to intentionally increase prices. Wow. <laughs> well, that sounds like the definition of demagoguing. And it's interesting because despite the CFTC, check out this one. This is truly special. CFTC. Beware of gold and silver schemes designed to drain your retirement savings. Hmm. That's an interesting note. Do we have the date on this one? Um, believe this was. Hmm. An investment scheme designed to drain your retirement savings. Well, I know one that I'm going to steer clear of personally. And of course, you would think the CFTC would be asking some of these questions, but apparently they are following the advice of uh, trust where JP Morgan is the custodian. They must have forgotten their agreement they reached and they're targeting the Reddit traders. Yes, I'm sure the Reddit traders can explain. Actually, hopefully the Reddit traders... If they ever get called to explain anything, they can just show these changes in the prospectus and this video from Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs, an authorized participant. And by the way, I'm very excited. Uh, in fact, here's what I can share about some legal developments. In the link below there in the description field, there is a link. We are gonna be hosting a legal call where I will be updating people on some of the information I found, some of the things that I've been doing to at least in an honest legal and moral fashion, help bring this to light. And especially if the CFTC has the audacity to go and try and hassle Reddit traders while all of this is going on, well, I'm organizing a call and you can find out more about that in the description field below. That will include information on the class action suit, um, CFTC, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Uh, really the purpose is not a lecture by me, but I know a lot of people have emailed. We do have a list. Some people are lawyers. I've spoken with lawyers already. And I mean, it's, it's gone too far. It's gone too far. Fortunately, it seems like the thing is unraveling as we speak. So I don't know that lawyers are going to be needed to resolve this. I'm quite fascinated to see what the end of February looks like, especially with wholesale dealers still paying above the regular spreads in the thousand ounce bars. And it has not escalated since what I reported last week, but it has not gone down either. Uh, we also have silver futures. We're in backwardation. I'll check on that later today. Um, so anyway, we'll carry on here. I want to get this one not too long. And we got a couple stories left. But here at Robinhood, among those subpoenaed in the federal probe of squeezing stocks, SEC, shame, shamefully enough, targeting retail people instead of the people who commit the crimes, even though they have, I mean, I wouldn't even say it'd be justified if they hadn't reached a settlement for $920 million with JP Morgan, but to do that, never explain it, see the same thing happen, see Jeff Curry tell you what happened. Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do the CFTC's job? Why does Andrew McGuire have to do the CFTC's job? Why does everybody who's in there in that Reddit trading group just being honest and sharing truth? And it, it, the only thing that happened was people pointed out how levered these things are. How come the CFTC isn't talking about the risk that to the extent that the sh aggregate short position exceeds the number of shares available for purchase, but they're going after the Reddit traders? Well, we will discuss more about the CFTC in that meeting. Again, the information is in the link below. Uh,
was that by closing the silver market, the Bank of England, to recover or force Hunt to settle out his contracts. My interview, uh, three days, let the market settle down, but they would not in any way settle out the contracts. They advised me that morning that they had word from now, in case you're wondering whether the CFT knows better or should know better, let's do a little review here of what happened 40 years ago, and we'll see if anything has really changed. The Bank of England, that if they stopped trading, it would be considered by the European market as a very bearish point of view. What the Bank of England was telling the CFTC in no uncertain terms was that by closing the silver market, they risked a major financial collapse on both sides of the Atlantic. As it turned out, the Commission decided to do nothing and let Beish take their chance when business started the following day. The situation was serious, potentially grave, but there's a philosophical line that has to be drawn. The CFTC is here to protect small customers and commercial users of the commodities markets. It is not here to protect large speculators and the brokerage houses that seek their business. That's not true. And you just saw why. That's what closing would have done. How far do you think this whole affair has damaged the confidence of the people that you seek to protect the small investors in commodity trading here in the United States? I would say that it has made people far more aware of the speculative, sometimes dangerously speculative nature of these markets. It will therefore make them more cautious. The lesson is probably uh, all to the good in that respect. But could it happen again? It could conceivably happen again. I don't think the tools we had available were strong enough to stop it. I think those tools should be put in place so it can't happen again. We can't take a risk that something which comes out of but simply a desire for excessive speculation is going to tear the financial fabric of the United States. We cannot take that risk again. Not only did they take that risk again, they're facilitating it. So again, uh, I wouldn't count on them to do anything. It looks like the market's taking care of that for the CFTC because here's an interesting one. First Majestic Silver, short squeeze potential remains high. It, it's amazing. It's the same thing I experienced 2007 when I first heard of subprime. Headline came out, Wall Street forgets about it, says everything's normal, doesn't even, and here's the thing. Again, don't, I'm not giving legal trading advice. I'm an analyst, not a financial advisor, but you can see it right here. I mean, the, these guys talking about the short squeeze went away. None of those articles touch on the massive buying in the retail market, the increased spreads in the wholesale market. The fact that they're changing the prospectus and going on TV and not mentioning that. So, yeah, you know, and that's how these things go, uh, which generally CNBC doesn't understand, but similar like a takeover deal. You know, one day the thing seems on and it trades to a higher premium. Then something happens with the deal. It trades lower. But that there's st it's just probabilities of something happening. And here, yes, the it didn't unravel completely that time but none of the underlying fundamentals of why there would be a short squeeze have changed so as always just make your own decisions on that and be careful about what you read uh, there's good information out there there's bad information out there i will hold to my pledge that i will always give you my best honest information possible there could be something i miss from time to time so that's why i always love getting multiple sources making my own decisions and with that said, now we have a little bit of mining stock news. Again, uh, sponsoring tonight's video is Winston Gold Core. And fortunately, Rob Keats of Gold Silver Pros is kind enough to come on. He's looked at Winston before and shared his thoughts. So here we go. I am here with Rob Keats of Gold Silver Pros, Gold and Silver, as well as Gold and Silver stock, mining stock extraordinaire. And Rob, we had a request from Winston Gold for review tonight, and I know you've taken a look at that, and perhaps you could share with me and the audience what you found and what you think. Yeah, Winston Gold is uh, a cool little company out there. Uh, they have a mining project near Polina, Montana. It's both a gold and a silver project. It has a lot of historic mining to it, and they were trying to get their drilling done and also rehabilitate the nearby mill 
said they'd go ahead and start production and they've made a lot of progress towards that since we last looked at them in October. So a lot of good news. And if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and share my screen and with your audience and talk a little bit about it. If you're interested in Winston Gold Corp, they trade on the Canadian Stock Exchange under the ticker WGC and on the OTCs here in the US under WGMCF. One note before we go to the project is the executive chairman and also major shareholder of the company, Joseph Caraba, because he has a lot of experience working for the board of Newmont, um, a director of Acon Group, as well as 20 years at uh, Rio Tinto. So they have a very good management team. I wanted to highlight this. That's always one of the things you want to look for when profiling a mining stock is who's managing it, what experience do they have, do they have experience doing the project that they're on? And I think uh, Winston has is off to a really good start there from a management standpoint. They've been announcing some news uh, re recently. So here we have one where they're entering into a joint venture that came out today with Bond Resources on the hard cash property in Montana. This is a, a relatively small deal. They're just in for a little bit of cash here, initial payment of US $2,000 and then small monthly payments of 1,500 bucks, annual payments of 25,000 to get into this previous producing property. So they're trying to acquire some assets in addition to the ones that they already have so that they can use all of that mill that they have available. Uh, the mill that they have, it's about 35 miles from the current mine site, will do up to 150 tons per day. Currently at their uh, mine location, they can do 120 tons per day. So they're probably trying to get more rock so they can run through that mine. They had really good test results recently, and this is what everybody's excited about. They produced the very first gold and silver concentrate uh, from the underground mining. Uh, as I said, they're right now, if they're 120 tons per day or 3,000 tons per, per month production, they can ramp that up to 150 tons per day. Uh, but they had really good gold returns, 1.7 I'm sorry, 1.75 grams per ton gold and almost a grant and sorry, 26.85 grams per ton silver. So those are really good numbers from the rock that they pulled out in their initial testing. Uh, 1,050 pounds of gravity concentrate, meaning at the very front of the process, the gravity process, they're pulling gold and silver out. And then as it goes down into uh, the ball mill and the flotation, they're getting additional gold and silver out of it. I think they're up to something like 92.76% gold recovery. And I think it's high 80% silver recovery. They had Bureau of Veritas go out there and look at their mining and mill process. And they think that they can, they can do better than that. So really good recovery rates, really good rates of gold and silver coming out of the ground. This is really good news for them. Here's the full test results if anybody wants to follow it. Uh, the average head grade gold was 1.75 grams per ton gold. Average head grade silver, 26.85. Both of those are, are, are good and profitable. So I would assume that they're gonna use the silver as an offset to the, to the gold mining, but they're sitting about three times what they need in the gold grade by itself to be profitable on this mine. And then you add in the silver and it's just sort of a bonus there. And especially where we think silver is going to go in the short term, that could turn into a really major uh, part of their overall profit that we're going to see. They've also been doing some things with the mine. I'm, I'll spare you the details, but they're connecting some, some drifts together so that they can have a secondary output on the mine and get more tons per day out. So again, they're working toward that 150 uh, tons per day doing a really good job of it. So we previewed them back in October. These were the things that they said they wanted to do that was part of their corporate presentation. Um, they have done all the things that they said they were going to do in the time they said they're gonna do it. And right now, I, you know, for people interested in near-term gold and silver producers, this could be a cheap entry point for people who wanna get into the stock. I think today it's trading around 12, 12 cents US. It's up on the news, uh, but that's nowhere near what the valuation could be once they get some revenues, you know, in the next quarter from all of that gold and silver that they're going to be producing. So this is one that's relatively short term. You can get into and probably come out pretty good on the other side. And Rob, just for people who want to follow along, what are the key hurdles, at least over the next couple of months that this is going to decide and things they can watch for to see if they meet their, their progress? Well, they've got to continue to pull the gold and silver out of the ground at the rate that they're doing it. Uh, one of the questions about this company is that they're a thin vein miner. So they're not going to go drill out the whole property and get a maiden resource and do a pre pre sorry preliminary economic analysis or PEA because it doesn't make sense to do it. What they're going to do is just follow the vein and mine that vein. Now, there is about 100 and I want to say 50 years of historical production here. So they're pretty confident in their vein, also in the extension that they can increase uh, what they're going to be able to mine over the next few years. 
And ThinVay miners tend to do pretty well. Uh, there's one down in Mexico called Impact Silver. People have heard me mention them quite a bit. They've been mining. They reopened that mine in 2007. Of course, that has mine production dating back to the 1850s. And Impact Silver has been doing very well for its shareholders. They found a lot of good silver on, and gold on their property. Winston is basically the same thing, except it's up here in Montana in the United States, a very friendly mining district. I expect that they'll have the same results. It's a little bit of a, of a question for a lot of people not having that resource estimate, but again, a lot of historic production there and they're on uh, the metal with their drill hole results and what they're pulling out of the ground. So they've already shown they can get the gold and silver out of the ground and they can do it profitably. And Rob, should they continue to follow through with the plan that they have in place and we see a rising gold and silver environment? Well, again, we don't know the future, but is this at least the kind of company that is positioned to get leverage on that move should the move occur? Absolutely, they will get a lot of leverage on that move. Like I said, they're able to get about three times the amount of gold out of the ground that they need to hit that profit level. And that's before you count the silver and that's at current prices. If we see gold go up above 2000 bucks and silver go up above $35, $40, you're gonna see them make a lot of money from this mine production. And again, they have a really nice field to mine that's historic. They've got a lot of historic data on where that gold and silver is. It's now with current precious metals prices very profitable and that's why they reopened uh, this mining site. So I expect, you know, it's blue skies ahead for them. Uh, they've got plenty of data on where to go mine and plenty of gold and silver in the ground. I don't see any really big near-term uh, issues that I would be worried about. Well, Rob, I appreciate that. Thanks for giving us that update. Again, uh, Rob is an analyst, so by all means that you need to consult your Financial advisors, before making any decisions, get your legal advice in place. But Rob, thanks for giving us uh, some starting points and a little update to look forward to. And again, Rob at goldsilverpros.com. And we will see you again soon, my friend. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So there you go. That's a little bit about Winston Goldcore. Thanks again to the folks at Winston for bringing everyone today's episode. And we also did have some recent Silver Sands news. You've seen Keith Anderson on the show. Uh, this was from two weeks ago, the day of a massive crime in the silver market. Although I think we'll eventually in due time be great news for Silver Sands because they have commenced their phase two drill program at the Virginia Silver Project, uh, expanding conceptual open pit structures. I'll put the link to this one in the description field below as well. And looking forward to having Keith back on soon to give us an update on how things are going. Also, some news from Silver Elephant, run by John Lee, who you've seen on the show, who I was planning to have yesterday until the power went down. But Silver Elephant completes acquisition of Monago Nickel Sulfide Project in the Thompson Nickel Belt. Um, and I know John's been excited, especially with things happening in the nickel market, let alone what's happening in the silver market. So the link to that one also in the description field below. Now, in terms of people in Europe, if you are looking for bullion, I'd like to point out Europa bullion, because if you go there now, there's a chance you could pick up a copy of the big silver short. It's nice to get a message from Europa bullion that they stocked up, they're cornered the market on the big silver short. And uh, perhaps if you place an order there, you can find out more and it's like a place where a good spot where you can get some gold and silver and that can be found at europabullion.com so i'd like to say thank you to the folks over there for picking up some copies of the book and spreading the word a few last notes before we wrap this one up uh hopefully i'll be able to do a live call sometime today we'll see how that goes but uh, Gold Week Africa happening between the 15th to the 18th. I was actually supposed to speak this morning, but wasn't able to find power for my slot. But interesting conference. And fortunately, Nicole of Gold Week Africa recorded a short comment on that last week. And I'll play that now so you can hear what Gold Week Africa is all about. Here we have the Gold West Africa website and conference. And I am joined by my new friend, Nicole Smith who is helping to organize the conference, which I'm excited about to actually get a non-US centric view of gold and all the things happening in the gold and silver market. So Nicole, could you give folks an idea of what's going on with the conference and what they'll, they'll be able to learn there? 
Thanks so much. So Gold Week, Week Africa takes place from the 15th to the 18th of February. It's a live and online event. So we're here in Lagos, Nigeria, the financial capital of Nigeria. Um, but we've got loads of people joining us next week uh, on our digital platform for the event. We actually don't call it a conference. We call it a series of information sessions because really the aim of Gold Week Africa is to give information to ordinary people, people within the gold sector about gold, the entire value chain from mines to market and everything in between. So we're looking at gold, uh, we're looking at gold mining, a, lo a lot of uh, mining projects in West Africa. We're looking at the jewelry value chain. We've got a one full day looking all at uh, jewelry design, gold and design art and utility, the luxury industry in Africa and uh, Africa's role in, in terms of the global luxury industry. And then we're also looking at gold as a financial instrument, gold and investment, um, looking at gold and cryptocurrency. Um, so really a lot of diverse topics, of really great speakers, experts in their fields coming on board and speaking at Gold, West Afri Gold Week Africa next week. Well, I'm sure looking forward to it, Nicole. I'm honored to be invited especially, uh, gee, for my Wall Street career, if there's ever an industry where, I mean, everything there is very Manhattan, New York centric, but it will be great <laughs> to get some outside perspectives. I appreciate you giving me a, a slot to share what I've been finding in the silver market, because I'm <laughs> guessing I'm finding out things by the day that are even blowing my mind, let alone that I think most people don't know about. And excited to be a part mm -hmm. of it and share just good information. Let folks know what's really going on and uh, I'll be excited to learn as well. So I will see you there. And can you give folks the date again and how they can get involved? Sure, so Gold Week Africa, information sessions taking part from the 15th to the 18th of February. Anyone can register on www.goldwestafrica.com. That's our website. Well, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate that. And two last quick notes before we wrap up. First of all, I would definitely keep an eye on Platinum. Platinum has been soaring. It got whacked down pretty thoroughly. It got whacked down pretty thoroughly yesterday. Massive volume spike. I'll get that chart out to you guys later. But here's the 30-day Platinum. You can see it was there on the 60-day at 1000 bucks in December and now at 1320 uh, was as high as here you can see it down today at 1240 ish let's call it was over 1320 and you can see quite a rally over the last couple of days uh, before getting knocked down yesterday and today but I would imagine that these some of the same banks that are short silver are probably some of the same ones that are short platinum and just seems like it just seems like there's a lot happening quickly because at the same time <laughs> we'll leave aside millions in Texas without power as grid falters so there's that going on but there is also But there is also a sell-off happening in the bond market. Again, as yields go up, that means that the price of the bond is going down. And especially over the past couple of days, you've seen the, the yields really jump. Here yesterday, 10-year rose to 1.31%. Let's take a look at our yield curve. See, the third from the last one is the 10-year, and then there's the 30-year. So if you go back, here's the 10 year, and you can see since February 4th, we're actually even February 2nd, the day that we had those wild events in silver, 18 basis points, but in particular, we didn't really move that much for the first week, but here's last Thursday, the 11th at 1.16%, jumps up to 1.2, then Monday really got clobbered up to 1.3. You can see again, here's the 30 year, seven basis points higher. So that's a pretty big sell off in the bond market. Perhaps a little early to say whether <laughs> someone has realized the inherent nature of the US dollar and treasury market and is fleeing, but certainly worth keeping an eye on. And um, 
but certainly worth keeping an eye on, which is what I will do here with you. Whether there's power or not, I'm going to find a way to get you the silver news. So hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. And coming your way now is a video about Winston Goldcore, our sponsor. So check it out. See if it's a good fit for you. Of course, consult your financial planner before making any decisions. But I will keep you posted on the markets. And thanks, as always, for being here.